going to speak about an analog quantum variational embedding classifier. Uh, okay, uh, my talk is uh, our analog quantum variational embedding classifier. And uh, it's a collaboration between our, between me and uh, these courses. Uh, so, uh, in a 2019 paper, Havlik proposed and demonstrated a variational embedding classifier based on a gate-based quantum computer. And in this IBM work, the data X is embedded as quantum state in a Hilbert space by this circuit, where U phi X is a data dependent entangling gate and H are the hard marks. So the circuit evolves some trivial initial state to some embedded state. And a key concept here is the decision operator W whose uh, expectation value gives basically a binary classification. So it uh, defines a hyperplane separating two classes in a Hilbert space. This is an uh, illustration of one qubit Hilbert space, block sphere, uh, embedding some data in some points on the block sphere. And, uh, this data is labeled, and you can find some operator to basically separate these two labeled data sets. And we can determine the decision operator in a variational way to best separate the two classes, or equivalently, we can fix in W and applying a variant circuit on the embedded quantum state. But the decision operator in the IBM paper is not a general solution. More general operators can be found in other literatures, such as C. Lloyd's 2020 paper. So in this 2020 paper, C. Lloyd proposed quantum metric learning, where they use a general decision operator, which works for a general multi-qubit case and this algorithm does classification based on the distance to some average density matrices, which are obtained by averaging embedded quantum states for each of the labels. And it's based on a parameter, parameterized QAOA circuits, where the rotation angles of the gates are the circuit parameters. And most importantly, the nonlinearity needed for the classification in this case is not purely from the quantum part. So following this thread, uh, uh, okay, uh, here are some details of the cis Lloyd's algorithm. The data is transformed by some neural network before being fed into some QAOA circuit which is basically some alternating single qubit and uh, two qubit entangling gates. And some of the parameters are filled with the uh, transformed uh, data. And the rest uh, parameters are taken as variational parameters to optimize or train the system. And uh, the density matrix, the rho and the sigma, that the, they are the ensemble density matrices corresponding to the two classes. And the decision operator for a binary classification is either rho minus sigma or pi plus minus pi sigma. And the pi plus and the pi sigma are the projection operators of rho minus sigma. Each decision operator will work, either one will work. And the expectation values of these decision operators gives the classification. And you can also visualize the clustering of the 
uh, embedded quantum state by the overlap matrix, which is basically uh, squared in the product of embedded states. Now let me talk about our classifier. Uh, our work and the previous classifiers have some similarities. But comparing with this Lloyd's classifier, the defining features of our classifiers are, first, we removed the neural network. So the nonlinearity in our classifier is arising completely from the quantum part, uh, from the nonlinear dependence of the final state on the schedule parameters. And we also replaced the gate circuit with an analog quantum computer, such as Anila. And we also extended uh, the case to multi-qubit case using a simple distance-based classifier. Uh, we use AO2 norm, basically. So the motivation is trying to answer two questions. One is, could the quantum part alone do the heavy lifting? that is providing the nonlinearity needed for classification. And another one is will an analog quantum evolution work. So here is an illustration of our algorithm. So the data reshaped into a d-dimensional vector will be transformed into some schedule coefficients by a linear transformation matrix. Then the schedule parameters define some schedule function and uh, which are just some driving on the qubits and they are coupling, couplings. And in here, we consider an annealing setting with independent control on the poly terms. So the system starts with a transversal initial Hamiltonian and ends at a final longitudinal Hamiltonian uh, with the controlling from the schedule function. And the system quantum state will evolve from some trivial initial state, that's ground state of the transversal initial Hamiltonian to some embedded final state. And uh, the nonlinearity in our classifier is different from that uh, in the neural network. So in a neural network, the nonlinearity is actually from the activation function such as sigmoid function used in the uh, network. But in our case, the nonlinearity is coming from the nonlinear dependence between the embedded quantum state and the Hamiltonian parameters. So if we just consider some data in 2D plane in some real space, that's points in some real space, then neural network basically transforms uh, the points from some real space to another real space. But in our case, the uh, transformation, uh, our classifier transforms the data from some real space into some Hilbert space. So it's kind of a new type of neural network. And we characterize our algorithm by a numerical simulation and the actual schedule in our simulation is actually a digitized version. And you increase the number of points, you can converge to the continuous case. And we tested uh, our classifier on some common linearly inseparable data sets. That's basically the uh, industrial standards for the machine learning such as the concentric circles, spirals, and missed digits. And these are basically not linearly separable. So we need some nonlinearity to classify them 
correctly. And our classifier works for all the above cases. And I will take the concentric circles and nest cases as examples. So for the concentric, concentric circles, it's basically some points distributed around some concentric circles with some nonlinear uh, gap separating these different classes. And uh, we can uh, basically visualize the uh, clustering of embedded data of different labels with overlap matrix. Uh, for overlap matrix, whose matrix elements are basically the uh, squared in the product between embedded quantum states. And for this uh, uh, illustrations, uh, these are the labels, circle one, circle two. That's the uh, label for the consent for concentric circles. And uh, each pixel represents the overlap between the embedded states. Uh, we can see that before the training, the overlap within the same class is basically the same magnitude as the overlap within uh, between embedded states from different classes. So the diagonal, block diagonal parts represents the uh, overlap within the same class. And the off diagonal squares here represents the overlap uh, for embedded states belongs to different labels. And we can see that after training, the overlap within uh, the overlap for the embedded states within the same class is not much larger than the overlap uh, between uh, different classes. So there is basically some clustering behavior involved here. And uh, we can also uh, basically visualize the separation of different classes by a trained classifier using some time evolution of the overlap matrix. And uh, uh, we can see that uh, uh, the uh, gregation or clustering behavior indeed shows up during the uh, time evolution caused by the uh, annealing Hamiltonian. And uh, in this sequence, the S equals zero case, this one is the starting of the annealing. So basically, uh, in this case, the whole system is just uh, at the initial state, at the travel state. So the overlap between any embedded states are equal. And with the uh, trained Hamiltonian, with the trained classifier, the annealing Hamiltonian will uh, lead to some deep data dependent evolution. So the initial state will be evolved and finally settling down at some final embedded states. And we can see after the evolution or the embedding process is finished, for the embedded states, it shows up this clustering behavior. All the embedded states within the same class uh, have a strong overlap, but uh, overlap between different classes are very weak. And we also uh, checked the influence of the number of qubits and the number of labels for uh, on the performance of our classifier. Taking the concentric circles as an example. So in these two figures, it shows the train or test accuracy as a function of number of qubits for 
two, three, four uh, labels or circles situations, we can see that uh, given the same number of qubits, uh, when you're increasing the number of labels or circles, like two circles, three six circles, four circles, the accuracy or the performance decreases. And when you're increasing the number of qubits but uh, fixing the uh, number of labels, the accuracy can increase when you increase the number of qubits. And uh, we can see the scaling on the test data and the training data is similar, suggesting a good generality on the unseen test data set. And these are uh, some results on the concentric circles data set. And we also tested our classifier on NIST digits on both Binary classification on digits three and five, I can't distinguish this by my eye, but this classifier can, yeah. Oh, digits one, three, five, three label classification case. And uh, uh, just as usual, we also visualize the clustering of the embedded data with overlap matrix. We can see before training, the overlap within the same class is basically as strong as the overlap uh, between different classes. But after training, the overlap uh, within the same class is very strong. But the overlap and the overlap uh, between different classes are very weak. So there's still the aggregation or clustering uh, phenomena. And again, we also do the visualization by checking the time evolution of the overlap matrix. At the beginning, it's all at the same state, so the overlap is uniform. After the uh, time evolution induced by the uh, data-dependent Hamiltonian, we finished the embedding, and the embedded data also shows clustering behavior. And here are some summary of our binary and uh, quinary uh, classification Asks, we can see that increasing the number of qubits can basically boost the performance on both the train and the test accuracy. So as a summary, we proposed an analog quantum variational embedding classifier using an analog quantum computer instead of a gate-based quantum computer. And the nonlinearity in our classifier is completely from the quantum part. And we also extended the variational classifier to multi-class case. And we tested our classifier on linearly inseparable data sets, such as concentric circles, spirals, and NIST digits. And the performance of our classifier can be improved by increasing the number of qubits. And as a lot look, we also tested some other Hamiltonian form, such as XX plus YY interaction Hamiltonian. You can find the details in some poster uh, that will be presented by another colleague from our group. And uh, probably we can also try to experimentally realize it, at least uh, for the single qubit case. That's probably the easiest to do. This work is supported by DARPA. Okay, that's my presentation. Yeah. Any questions? Thank you for the talk. We can move to the question from the audience. Yes. I didn't completely follow the design of the algorithm uh, you implemented using the annealer, uh, but uh, could you explain uh, the uh, motivation for why you think, or do you think that uh, uh, it uh, has the potential to be better than the algorithms for the classical computers? In some respect, uh, the nonlinearity part will be not 
classically simulable for larger system. So that's uh, the main argument. It could provide some nonlinearity that's beyond the catch of a classical system. But whether it will be better than classical classifiers, that's an open question. So uh, the nonlinearity is hard to simulate classically, but uh, uh, there is uh, so in order to uh, for the algorithm to have a better performance, uh, the nonlinearity should not only be hard to simulate classically, but also help uh, like the specific way uh, of the nonlinearity should uh, help in the generalization or with the performance of the algorithm, right? Yeah, that is uh, the point that uh, maybe a large quantum system can have better expressivity as some maybe clues from a tensor network or something like that. Yeah. The quantum system have the potential to have a better expressivity Okay, uh, other questions? Uh, there's a question in the chat, Dr. Young. Oh, okay, okay, L let, me, let me check. Can you read the question, uh, Love? Okay, uh, the question is, is there some obstacles to testing this approach using a quantum annealing device instead of an analog quantum simulator? Uh, the, actually, the Hamiltonian setting we use here is indeed a quantum annealing device. It uh, anneals from uh, the initial transverse Hamiltonian to some final longitudinal Hamiltonian. It's exactly a quantum annealer. So there will be no uh, fundamental difficulty to try it on an annealing device. And uh, since uh, annealer is, uh, uh, is basically running in some continuous mode, so I, I call it the analog quantum computer. It's, uh, it's some terminology I think appropriate. Yeah. Okay, was there some other question from the audience? Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. It was certainly an interesting approach. I have two questions that are kind of related. Um, namely, on slide 14, you show like the performances of the classifier um, over the number of um, qubits I think you used. Yeah. Um, it seems like that for the uh, three and like or for the three level, it's for the three label uh, problem, it seems that the performance kind of seems to converge to a value that's lower than one. Uh, did you try to uh, did you try for larger systems and eventually went up to to one, or did it remain at that level? Uh, eight is already very time consuming to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We need a bigger computer and a better numerical simulation code to push further. Yeah. Okay. So the second kind of related question, if I may. Uh, um, most universality proofs for neural networks that I'm aware of, or even all of them, they kind of rely on the trainability of, of the weights that you apply after applying the nonlinearity. Um, so do you have any trainable parameters in your approach that you use after the nonlinearity or only before the nonlinearity? Uh, I, I don't quite get your question. Could you explain it again? Um, yeah, so in the, in the neural network, basically, wherever you draw an arrow, you have like a trainable weight, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah our weights are all in this part. Exactly. So do yeah. you have also, in where you drew the arrow that you labeled as Hamiltonian, do you also have any trainable weights in that, like in, uh, in that part of the algorithm? Uh, yeah, the Hamiltonian part, we uh, don't have variational parameters to train on. Yeah. The, okay. All the parameters are just uh, defined by this transformation here convert the data into some scheduled parameters. 
So all the weights are here. We use a very simple setting. Yeah, of course you can add more variability features into these settings. Yeah, but we we just choose the simplest possible case. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. Ah, another yes. Oh. Okay. So, <laughs> thank you again. Um, You're welcome. So, uh, have you thought about any? Uh, if that's a universal classifier, if that should always work, or um, is it kind of like? An algorithm that seems to be working from your numerical experiments, but like uh, mathematically, you haven't analyzed it yet. Oh, uh, going from numerical experiments to um, computational science, maybe the computational complexity. I think it's a big leap. Yeah, we don't have, uh, we ha haven't touched that okay. part yet. Yeah. All right. Thanks. And the other fairly. Brief question is, um, I think one was on slide five where you explained actually Seth Lloyd's algorithm. I'm not sure if I can ask you about that, but uh, they use like this uh, ResNet part and like for the for the feature extraction, I assume. And do you know though if those if in their approach if they freeze those weights or do they train those as well? Uh, they use some pre-trained pre ResNet, but uh, making this part uh, changeable yeah. variable. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, if there are not more any questions, I will thank again Dr. Yang for his talk.